Before we look at the third example, which is going to illustrate using a data table, let's talk a bit about the data table element and its associated element column, both of which are in the HTML namespace. Data table on output will render as a number of rows, one row per object in a given collection. It will also render as an HTML table and each of the nested elements will describe one row. Within the data table, we nest column elements. Those column elements represent a single column, which will be repeated over and over again for each row, and therefore will be repeated for each object in the collection. As part of the description for that column, we have the option of specifying what the header is, we have the option of specifying what the footer will be, and of course we should also specify the contents of that column. When the column is rendered, if it's part of the header, it will be rendered as a th element in the HTML. And in all other cases, whether it be content or footer, it will be rendered as a td element. Again, there are several attributes that could be used. I'm only showing a few of them here. With the data table, the first thing that you notice here is the value attribute. And that will specify the collection that is to be displayed in the table. And typically, this will come from a backing bean, and this property then will relate to the getOrderLines method, and that method will return a collection. The var attribute will provide a name for the current object that is being rendered for the current row, and we'll see where that's used in a few moments. The style class attribute is for specifying the CSS style name for the table, the header class for the header row, and all other rows within the contents, not the footer, because we could also have a footer class, but all the other rows in between the header and the footer that contain the data can have one or more style names. If you provide more, then the first one is used for the first row, the second one for the second row, and then it cycles back to the first row and so on. If you provide three, then first, second, third rows will be the first, second, third styles that you provide, and then it cycles back again. For each column element, we can specify a header, as shown here. And again, we use the facet element nested within the column with name equal header to say, this is the value that I want in the header for this column. You can see in this example that we've got a literal value but it could just as easily be some kind of value that is extracted from the backing bean. In fact, in the example code that I'll be looking at in a few moments with you, the footer is done in, in just that way. We use a dynamically generated value in the footer. So for this given column, there is going to be a header with fruit, a footer with the, val with the value total displayed, and the, the contents of the data rows are provided by this value here. Notice the use of line. That's the name that is given to the object in this attribute here for the data table. So here's a partial example. You can see that we're specifying a footer class as well in the data table element. And then in the column element, we've got the header, which is this literal value. And the footer is not using a literal value, but it's using a value that comes from the backing bean using this property here and then the data rows will use this value. Essentially what's going to happen in this column is that for each object, and therefore for each row, there will be a cost, and we're likely to have multiple rows, and it would be very nice from the user's point of view to see the total cost for all those rows, and that's what this will calculate and return, and will be displayed in the footer. Again, just emphasizing the point that the var value in the data table is the name for the object in the current row being displayed. So the third variation of our ordering of fruit takes the example a little bit further. We're going to start off with a view that displays the table of the complete order of fruit. So presumably it will start with no rows at all and then by clicking on the add fruit button will then display the choose fruit view that we've been looking at in the first two examples. And when that's submitted, it will take us back to here, except now the data table will have been updated and 
peaches one and a half will then have been displayed in here. If we were to add more peaches, then we wouldn't expect to see a second row in the data table. We would expect to see the peaches row updated with a new quantity and a new cost. If we were to cancel, then we'd expect to come back to the, the data table view without any updates taking place. If there are any errors in choosing the fruit, then instead of displaying them here, upon submission we'll come to this page here and see the error messages. And when clicking cancel, we'll come back to here or clicking back, we'll come back to there to allow us to modify the selection. So those are the three views and the transitions between them. Now, what have we added in here? Well, we've, we've still got the backing bean, the fruit backing bean here, but we also need a backing bean for that table. And this is what the class diagram now looks like. So here's the fruit backing bean. It's still got its array of select items, each item having a reference to a fruit object. We've still got the fruit converter, but now because we've got this other view that has an order, the list of all fruit ordered, we're going to have this backing bean for the order and each line will be an object here. And so the backing bean is going to maintain a collection, in this case an array list, of order line objects. These methods here, the get order lines, will allow us to retrieve the entire array list, which is what the data table needs to be able to display the list of order lines. There's an add to order method and an add quantity method that will allow us to update the order as we go on. You'll see how that works in a few moments. In the beans package, we've now got two beans, one for fruit, one for order line. Take a look at the order line. This is a reference to the fruit object, the quantity, and then old quantity. You'll see in a bit perhaps why we shall need that. Adding quantity will allow us to update the quantity for this fruit. So if the user says I want half a kilogram of peaches and then subsequently clicks on add again and says now I want another kilo of peaches, instead of having two peach objects created it's going to find that peach object that has currently got half a kilo in it and then add the one kilo to the half to give a total of one and a half. Sometimes, for example, if we're cancelling, we might want to undo the last update. And that's what we're keeping old quantity for. So that we know what it was before the update and then if we want to undo the update, we can restore the value of old quantity into quantity. The fruit order backing beam maintains the list of objects that are going to be displayed in the data table. And then we have those methods that are listed in the class diagram. I'll leave you to look at those in your own time as you explore the code and try to work out how it works. Now, when we first run the application, we can see that there's been no order at all. Therefore, the table is empty. Now, this might be a situation where we could get the array list and then say, well, if the array list has got no object stored within it, then we don't need to render the table. So we could use that rendered attribute on the data table to make it equal to false, and then we wouldn't have this puzzling header, footer, and no data in the middle. Adding a fruit takes us to what we've seen already. Let's make it half a kilo and submit. And now we can see that our half kilo at the price of 2.20 a kilo costs 1.10. Let's add in a different fruit, pears, let's make it 4.5 kilos. And you can see that the footer is updating. Now let's put in another quarter of a kilo for cherries. So we add fruit, cherries 0.25. So we now expect the order line to update from 0.5 to 0.75, which it would do if we had two decimal places. But because we're only displaying with one decimal place, the rounding has occurred automatically. Now, why is that? Why is it only displaying one? Well, let's go and have a look at the fruit order view. In the quantity column, so here's the quantity column, we can see that we're using a converter, one of the standard converters, to display the double value that is the quantity. And we've specified that the minimum number of fraction digits and the maximum number of fraction digits is one. And that's why we've only got one decimal place. If I were to change that to two, 
save it and well, let's add and then cancel. And we can see that the total has now got two decimal places. I've still got to change for the data. That was in the footer. Now for the data, we do exactly the same thing. Save and refresh. And now we've got two decimal places there. So the converter has done its job. It's taken the double value and rendered it as a string with two decimal places. Now I clicked on the cancel button a few moments ago. The cancel button is a kind of submission in as much as it's a command button. And whenever we click on a command button, it will cause that life cycle that we've talked so much about to get underway, which will include taking all those selected values. So let's say we haven't selected anything and we click submit, we'd expect to get an error message. If we click cancel, that's also going to submit the form and do the error checking and output error messages and not allow us actually to cancel and go back. That's a problem. But we can get around that problem by using in the can there's the, the command button for cancel. Notice that we've got this attribute called immediate that is set to true. What that does is completely bypass all the conversion and validation and updating of the model. It will immediately go to the selected view that is nominated by the action cancel. Remember in the facesconfig.xml file, there are a set of navigation rules. And the navigation rule that says from choosefruit.xhtml, when we get the case of cancel, then go back to the fruit order xhtml. If we don't have immediate, in fact, I'm going to take that out for a moment and save it. Click on cancel. Now, because it's not immediately going to the view, it's no longer bypassing the life cycle. So it's doing the conversion and the validation, and it won't let you get past it's always going to say, sorry, you can't do this. And that's a problem. And that's why we need the immediate attribute on the cancel button, which will allow us to go back. So I've shown you the important aspects of the code in terms of today's discussion, which is using panel grid and data table elements, and also illustrating how to guide user choice, in this case, using a list box. What you should do is to now examine that code in a bit more detail and make sure you understand everything that is going on. And if you're not clear about anything, please get in touch.